Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm Eileen Revy. I'm the Deputy Director at Rank the Vote. And we are very excited to bring you today's program featuring Congressman Jamie Raskin discussing the Ranked Choice Voting Act, which he introduced last month. This federal legislation will strengthen American democracy and promote fairer and more representative elections by implementing ranked choice voting for all congressional primary and general elections. You'll also hear from key leaders in the election reform movement, including experts from Fair Vote and Represent Women. We are very excited to be putting this program together on uh, with both of those organizations. Uh, we all work together across the country on ranked choice voting at all levels of government. So we'll be hearing from uh, Meredith Sumter, the Fair Vote's president and CEO, Cynthia Ritchie Terrell from Represent Women, the executive director and founder, uh, as well as Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's 8th D Congressional District. Congressman Raskin is a was a constitutional law professor and is known for his leadership during the second impeachment trial of former President Trump and his advocacy for democracy reform and civil rights. He is the ranking member of the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability. Prior to Congress, Representative Raskin served three terms in the Maryland State Senate, delivering a series of landmark legislative accomplishments, including leading the effort for Maryland to become the first state to ever pass the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So thank you so much for joining us this morning, Congressman, and I will turn it over to you. Well, good morning, Eileen. I'm delighted to be with everybody, and uh, thank you for your great leadership on this critical issue. Um, uh, I've been around the country in the thick of this uh, presidential campaign uh, and campaign for Congress, um, and we're talking a lot about defending democracy, um, and that phrase is a bit misleading because it implies that democracy is this static collection of um, laws and practices, which it is partly, but democracy is something much more than that. Democracy is always an unfinished project. It's a process in motion. And in uh, Democracy in America, Tocqueville said that he observed that um, in our country, um, th that democracy and voting rights are either shrinking and subsiding or they're growing and expanding. Um, and so we've been in very much a contractionary retrenchment mode in terms of uh, democracy and voting rights. And we've got to get back on the growth track. And a central part of that, to my mind, is ranked choice voting, improving our voting system so we can get to <clears throat> real majority rule in terms of the electoral process. Um, one day, somebody's going to write a great paper. Maybe somebody on uh, in our audience today will write a great paper in school about um, minority rule in the career of Donald Trump because uh, Trump uh, has thrived on um, not having ranked choice voting, on being able to win a minority of the vote in a lot of different places, both in Republican primaries, but of course also in the Electoral College. And that's stated just as an academic, non-partisan uh, observation, not as a partisan uh, dig in any way. Um, but in any event, um, we're going to have to get back on the growth track. And that, to me, um, means we need to have majority winners in every election for Congress across the country. And um, that's just going to be a product of our electoral design. Um, right now, um, people are winning primaries with 38 percent of the vote, 32 percent of the vote, 28 percent of the vote in a five or six way primary. Um, that person is not necessarily the one who would have been chosen uh, by a majority of the voters, even in their primary. Um, and the same kind of thing uh, happens in uh, general elections where we have uh, plurality winners instead of majority winners if you have third party or third and fourth party uh, independent candidates. And so ranked choice voting is all about making sure that the person who wins really is the consensus favorite of everybody who's voting. Um, I assume most people on the call know how it works. If there are five candidates running for Congress in your party primary, you rank all five of them. If somebody gets 50 percent plus one on the first ballot, then they're the nominee. But if not, if the high 
you know, the high ranker has just like 42 percent of the vote. You drop the lowest candidate and redistribute their uh, second choice um, candidates uh, to the others. And if that creates a majority winner, then you've got it. If not, you keep using that process all the way down. Um, and it's been used with great effect and with great popularity all across the country from Maine to Alaska. And I actually have colleagues in Congress, um, both of whom uh, were elected under ranked choice voting systems, Jared Golden um, and Mary Paltola from Alaska. Um, so in addition to guaranteeing uh, majority support, there are lots of other corollary benefits to doing it this way. It takes care of this so-called spoiler problem because now you can vote your heart's content on the first ballot. And if your person doesn't make it, then uh, your vote would be redistributed to a second choice or third choice uh, winner, you know, depending on uh, the context. Um, and I think um, most significantly, and I don't know to what extent this has been a surprise for people around the country as ranked choice voting has been adopted, um, it has really significantly diminished negative politicking because the whole logic of the electoral process changes. Now, instead of trying to subtract votes from your opponents by engaging in negative politics and character assassination, the um, the built-in political tendency of RCV is to reach out to those people and say, oh, um, Eileen's your first choice. I love Eileen too. Well, please consider me for your second choice. Um, we have a lot in common. We have a lot of overlap in terms of our policy commitments and so on. Um, and so it favors coalitional politics, positive coalitional politics instead of uh, divisive negative politics. And um, so I think that the, all of these benefits are going to be to the significant advantage of American politics moving forward. Um, the, the, my legislation would apply both to uh, primary federal elections as well as uh, general federal elections. And if you want to look at some uh, some elections where it's made the difference, check out uh, Jared Golden's election in Maine and Mary Peltola's um, election in Alaska. But it's working all over the country, and you know we can share all that information with everybody. Um, but this is. Uh, a reform that should appeal to people across the political spectrum, anyone who really believes um, in majoritarian politics rather than having the rule of particular minority parties or minority political factions. So with that, I'm happy to turn it back over to you, Eileen, and I don't know if we were going to do questions or not. Yeah, thank you so much, Congressman Raskin. Um, we absolutely can take a, a one or two questions before we uh, move on to, to Meredith. Um, I think speaking to the impact that this could potentially have on gerrymandering at the federal level would be helpful if you can um, speak to that a bit, please. Yeah. Um, well, gerrymandering, of course, is its own problem, and we do have to address it completely uh, on its own. And we have... Uh, favored the creation of independent, nonpartisan uh, commissions to uh, draw districts. And I favor multi-member districts um, and the use of ranked choice voting, where we will get um, the most representative composite portrait of the electorate um, going to Congress or going to a state legislature. Um, <clears throat> but I think that... Um, you know, one of the problems we have right now with America being locked into gerrymandered districts in large parts of the country um, is that it tends to favor uh, the most extreme tendencies within a particular party. Um, and um, obviously, it's it's easier to see uh, how that works in the other person's party. So I'll tell you that, you know, I've got a lot of uh, Republican colleagues who just dare not cross Donald Trump because they feel that um, they will be defeated in their primary um, <clears throat> by a candidate who's willing to, you know, to follow the Trump line and do whatever Trump tells them to do. Um, the uh, effects of that, I think, are going to be dampened with uh, ranked choice voting. Um, <clears throat> But I do think, you know, we're going to need a, a separate remedy to address gerrymandering. 
Thank you, Congressman. And we do have several questions about where the bill stands. Um, of course, it was just introduced last month. Can you speak to the process that it would have to go through and, and how you feel about the likelihood of, you know, all of us working together to build support for this across the country and get it through the House? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the time is now to really begin educating people about how it works and why the values of it are so critical and imperative in American politics at this moment. Um, the you know we don't have much hope that um the current um the gop majority in the house is going to be interested in it because they haven't brought forth any electoral reform legislation in this congress um but i have high hopes for what's going to happen um in the 119th congress in the next congress and i hope it will be part of a full panoply of electoral reform measures that we need to get democracy moving and growing and uh, energized again um you know the alternative to democracy is collapsing into some other form of government like theocracy and there are clearly people pushing a christian white nationalist agenda like in project 2025 um autocracy, which is what um, Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un and President Xi are pushing for around the world and Viktor Orban, um, plutocracy and kleptocracy. And, you know, kleptocracy is just um, government exists not to serve the common good in the public interest, but just to serve the interests of the guy who gets in, who's going to make as much money as possible. And that's the rule of kleptocrats, and it is closely connected to rule of the autocrats. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, I'll just give you one last question here. If you were to give, uh, you know, someone saying this is seen as a partisan effort, uh, what is your top line for response that people can use to respond to this, that this is something that everyone should agree with? Well, I mean, I hope it's not going to be a partisan effort. Right now, it's mostly Democrats pushing it. But if you don't look to uh, who's pushing it now, but you look to who it will serve, it's completely nonpartisan or cross-partisan. It helps anybody who thinks they can assemble a majority in a particular district in a particular election for House or Senate. Um, and so that, by definition, is open to any political party, which is willing to develop a political program and a campaign that appeals to the broadest number of people, as opposed to trying to appeal to a narrow band of the electorate. And that obviously is destructive of democracy in the long run. Um, and that's why, you know, if you look at American history, the anti-democratic mechanisms have been successively stripped away by constitutional amendment or by other policy changes. I mean, um, you know, most people couldn't vote when the country started. Um, and now the 15th Amendment says, you, you know, it bans race discrimination in voting and the Voting Rights Act also tried to deal with that. Women couldn't vote in most places. The 19th Amendment uh, tried to deal with that. There were poll taxes blockading people's access to the polls, and the 24th Amendment dealt with that. We moved from um, state legislative selection of U.S. senators to popular election of senators in 1913 and the, the 17th Amendment. So um, the bottom line is uh, this is the direction we've got to move in, and we need uh, massive popular education around the country um, about ranked choice voting and the importance of uh, being able to get majority winners everywhere and to flip all of the incentives around so that positive politicking is a product of electoral design rather than negative politicking. And I think we're going to see that. And I do think that that will be a very popular feature of our ranked choice voting act. Yeah. Thank you so much for your leadership on this issue, Congressman, and for joining us this morning. It's been really great speaking with you. We appreciate your time. Uh, it's my honor. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for your leadership, Eileen. And um, please um, uh, send my best to all of the activists and organizers around the country uh, who are trying to make this critical reform happen. Yeah, thank you so much. Next, we're going to uh, bring up Meredith Sumpter. Meredith, uh, as president and CEO of FairVote, she is working to advance a more functional and representative democracy that delivers for every American. 
Meredith is an experienced public and private sector leader and most recently served as CEO of the Council for Inclusive Capitalism and the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. Meredith, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Oh, thanks so much, Eileen. It's great to be with you and, of course, always with Congressman Raskin and also with Cynthia here on the line. Um, it's exciting to see the momentum that is building behind the Ranked Choice Voting Act and Ranked Choice Voting, uh, which is, as the congressman was sharing, it's a party neutral reform that is winning and working across the country. Uh, and I just uh, I know the congressman just left us, but I was I was struck by where he where he brought us in this discussion which was a focus on real majority rule to get our democracy back to work. Uh, and this is something that, you know, a healthy democracy, it ensures that the, the views and the needs of those that are governed are being taken into account. And that is not how our system is currently working. And the American people of all political stripes and backgrounds, they know it. Uh, so, you know, only 15% of House congressional elections are competitive. This means that 85% of congressional elections for the House of Representatives are, are decided in the primaries. Uh, and generally, 8% of Americans are reliable primary voters. So currently, you know, a fraction of the fraction of the U.S. electorate, those who vote in primaries are deciding who makes the rules for all of us. Uh, and it's no surprise uh, to us at Fair Vote that 85% you know, of Americans don't think their elected representatives care about their views. That means that our system is currently not working in the interest of those who are governed. With RCV, that would change. All voters would have increased say, and you would have that energized, dynamic democracy that the congressman was speaking about, you know, busy solving problems and creating value for the American people. This is a reform. It doesn't favor any particular party. It actually favors voters. And it elects leaders who have strong party backing, but are, are leaders who can engage uh, with voters they represent broadly. Um, voters who will elect them, not maybe not as their first choice, but also as their second or perhaps their third choice. Uh, so I know we're here, um, Eileen, to, to talk about the Ranked Choice Voting Act, which the Congressman just introduced, um, along with Senator Welch and Congressman Beyer. And so just to a few top level points of what the Ranked Choice Voting Act would do, and then would love to, um, to discuss this act further with you and take questions as well. Um, so what is the Ranked Choice Voting Act? Uh, the first, that the bill would implement Ranked Choice Voting for US Senate and House of Representative elections. Uh, and this would start in 2028. Uh, and as the Congressman stated that the act is designed to work with states where they are. Uh, so it applies both to traditional partisan primaries, but also open all candidate primary elections. Uh, the bill also includes funding for states that switch to ranked choice voting. So this could include supporting things like voter education and election poll worker training. Though actually many states will actually save money um, with this act because they would be replacing runoffs uh, with just a singular ranked choice voting um, election. Uh, so fair vote along with um, represent women and, and rank the vote, we have long been pushing for ranked choice voting because it brings great improvements in how our, um, our elections are run and how our governing systems are responding uh, to the needs of the governed in the states and localities where ranked choice voting is in use. Uh, we believe uh, that our democracy is strongest when every vote is heard and respected. Uh, and in the 100 years that ranked choice voting has been in the United States, and in the 25 years that Fair Vote has been tracking uh, ranked choice voting elections, it's clear that the, the data is on our side. Voters have greater say and more choice in who represents them. There is less partisan rancor and negative campaigning, but there's also, and this is the part I love most about it, there is greater incentive for elected leaders to represent the majority of their district or state. So this leads to more problem solving and coalition building and a focus on getting things done. Uh, so ultimately the RCV Act, this is a pro-democracy bill that will benefit the American people and it will enable our congressional leaders to do the work that we the people elect them to do. Uh, so with that, we'd love to turn back to you, Eileen, and, and take questions or open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, Meredith. 
We really appreciate your, your leadership and all of fair votes on this. Um, can you speak to the number of rankings? We, we have that question popping up a lot of, of why we, we come to the numbers we do. Obviously a decision has to be made eventually, but um, you know, the, around why five was chosen for this bill. Uh, the number of rankings that a that a that are chosen by a, a state um that that would be av available yeah so in the the rcv act i believe it's it allows for five uh for the races and so how we came to this number um so the the bill was written uh, in concert with several different offices that that contributed to it. You know, currently uh, with ranked choice voting that is being passed at the state level, uh, there are proposals for either four or five rankings. Ultimately, fair vote doesn't take a position on whether there should be four or five, uh, more or less. Uh, I think what's important to us is that voters have a say and they're able to rank their preferences uh, uh, when they are electing their leaders. And that's the really important aspect uh, of this. Uh, and that when you look at what leads to majority rule and what leads to the will of majority being represented in how our legislators are able to do their work, it really comes down to that one reform rank choice voting that does give voters more say and more choice. I think ultimately from their votes perspective, um, voters have the option to rank, right? So if you want to rank um, up to three or up to four, up to five, um, voters have the option to do that on their ballot. Uh, the RCV Act uh, does have five as its number of, of ranking. Um, but I think what's important for us to do is to see from the laboratories of democracy in the states that have adopted ranked choice voting, that is Maine and Alaska. And then we have four additional states uh, that are looking to put RCV um, on the ballot uh, this November. We will be able to collect data on how voters are making use of their ballot and what that means for who gets elected and how they are incentivized to work on behalf of the voters who put them into power. Thank you so much, Meredith. When we, uh, one of the questions we've gotten here speaks to Thanks. how this could look for U.S. Senate races. Um, that's something that's, you know, not, uh, I think, as much discussed in people's mind when they think about RCV because we are doing so much work uh, at the state and local levels across the country. Um, is that something that you could see really transforming the, the way that the Senate is now and how it's representative of the population? Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I think we've seen it's very clear that the data that we have on ranked choice voting elections is that uh, more women and candidates of color run and win in these elections. And that's really important at a time when our country is is changing so rapidly. We really need elected leaders who represent all of us and are able to bring all of our perspectives to the table when they are making the rules that govern uh, how we, we live as a, a people. Uh, and so when you look at the, the potential for ranked choice voting use in Senate races, in addition to use in, in House races, I think it's, you're gonna see a meaningful difference uh, in who gets considered uh, in these races, a meaningful difference in American votes mattering toward those um, officials whom they truly believe are going to well represent their interests. And we see it already um, uh, just at the, uh, the state level of the House race and the election of Mary Potola from Alaska. This is the first Native Alaskan voted into Congress and the first woman voted to represent um, Alaska in the House. Uh, and so I'm confident uh, with passage of the RCV Act uh, that you're going to see uh, more meaningful uh, and fair representation of the American people more broadly, both in the Senate, but also in the House. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, next, I'm going to bring up uh, Cynthia Richie Terrell, and then she is going to speak, and then we'll reopen it up for, for questions for everyone. Um, so Cynthia Richie Terrell is the founder and executive director of Represent Women and an outspoken advocate for institutional reforms to advance women's representation and leadership in the United States. 
She and her husband, Rob Ritchie, helped found Fair Vote, uh, and she has worked on projects related to women's representation, democracy, and voting system reform in the U.S., uh, and, and also worked to help parliamentarians around the globe meet U.N. goals for women's representation and leadership. Thank you so much for joining us, Cynthia. Really looking forward to, to your remarks on this and uh, how hopefully this can help with gender parity in Congress. Thank you so much, Eileen. Great to be on a call. What a dream team. Eileen and Jimmy Raskin and Meredith Sumter. Oof. Uh, you, we've got a, a powerful, compelling group of people here who uh, I think of the many common threads, we all really care about democracy and we care about um, not just the campaign process, but the process of governing itself. And I think that's a, a good entry point to um, touch on some of the stats related to women's representation, because I think the the analysis from leading um, consulting firms like McKinsey and others, <clears throat> I think really emphasizes how it's really hard to make good policy when the uh, the governing body doesn't include a lot of different lived experiences. And that's what we see in US politics today is that um, we, there, there are certain types of uh, people who uh, get elected and they remain in office because of the power of incumbency. And uh, I, I think we really need to um, embrace innovation in reforms like the Ranked Choice Voting Act and the Fair Representation Act, which I think some of the folks on the call are aware of and are also interested in, which in a lot of ways um, sort of busts up the log jam of our current electoral system and would help uh, to elect more women um, for a number of reasons. And I'm happy to, to talk more about that. But um, before I do the a little more information about RCV, just wanted to emphasize how truly remarkable it is that the US is such an outlier in terms of the representation of women. We are one of the oldest democracies in the world and we are behind almost all of our allies in the percentage of women in office at all levels of government. Uh, women hold about 29%, uh, 28% of seats in Congress. Um, and that's just not, a, it's not a good standing to put us in when we're trying to navigate um, a, a changing world in terms of policy and uh, really needing those lived experiences of everybody in the kitchen, um, excuse me, everybody at the country, everybody in the country at the kitchen table where decisions were being made or in Congress. So the, the good news around ranked choice voting, and now we have oof, you know, more than 20 years of experience with it. So we can say with a lot of certainty, what the data tells us. It's not, we're not like interpreting data. We're just seeing the results of these ranked choice voting elections, which is pretty exciting. I put a note in that I think it's the largest city in seven, seven states now use ranked choice voting. So that's a lot of voters and a lot of elections. So these stats have a lot of meaning and women hold 53% um, of seats in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting. And it's easy to see how that could really transform Congress, who sits in in uh, those seats on in Capitol Hill, and how that would, I think, really strengthen our democracy in a lot of ways. And people often um, wonder. The next question people often have is like, "Well, is there some guarantee? You know, does R RCV guarantee an outcome?" And it's not so much that, but RCV helps to address the barriers that women and other marginalized voices face in politics. So when uh, women um, in our current system are interested in running for office, and there are a lot of great pipeline programs that are really encouraging women, and preparing women to run for office, they're often told to wait their turn. That's the big, that, the big line, because the danger is uh, the risk of spoiling the vote and leading to one of the uh, a primary winner that Congressman Raskin was talking about in United America and other orgs have so identified as a real problem when we're electing people with just 20 or 30 percent of the vote. But in our city election, multiple women can run with no fear of splitting the vote. There's more civility in context where it's replacing on runoff election. It actually can cost less. And the data is showing also that turnout is up. So more people are participating. The elections are more civil. Issues um, really are the main thing in the campaign and, and uh, candidates have an incentive to find common ground because if Meredith, Eileen and I are all running for um, a seat in Congress, we wanna find that common ground because I want Eileen's supporters to rank me second or third and Meredith's supporters to rank me second or third. So it's really a beautiful um, mechanism to change the incentives that we face now that um, right now, of course, leads to the rancor and the hyper-partisanship and the polarization that I think is really undermining 
much of uh, what we're trying to get done in the world. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of RCV. I'm a big proponent for addressing the uh, systemic barriers that women face in politics with systemic solutions. And while there are a lot of solutions that are important, for sure, I don't think there's anything as transformative as election reform. And the fact that, uh, you know, the, the United States ranks behind 74, 75 nations for the percentage of women in office, those other nations, you know, I'm here to tell you, don't have better women, they don't have better men, um, they may have better food, but they have definitely have better voting systems that just give voters more power. That's the bottom line. Thank you, Cynthia. So you said uh, jurisdictions that use RCV have, you said 53% women. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about just what that would look like for Congress compared to the number of women that we have in Congress now and how you could see that really being transformative in both chambers? Yeah, I think one of the... Um... The, the the thing that happens in primaries now um, is that there's a sense in this hyper-polarized environment that we have to pick a, a candidate who can win an election. And there are a lot of, I think, tropes and misunderstandings about um, what a, 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 a candidate needs to have done to be able to win a seat. Um, incumbency is a formidable challenge. And I think the, um, the adoption of the RCV Act would help to erode some of that calcification. You'd see a, a more dynamism in the primary process. Um, there would be multiple candidates who might feel like running. Again, they'd be finding common ground. It wouldn't be an overnight uh, solution to all the problems we're facing, but I think we'd see more women, more younger people, more men of color um, uh, running in these races. And the political parties, I think genuinely and authentically, being more ready to support them because they realize that there's not a risk of them spoiling the election. I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding now. It's it's not that the Democratic Party and maybe even the Republican Party, though I'm no expert actually on either of those parties, they 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 care about the health of our democracy, but they're just so locked in this battle to make sure they don't lose any seats. But I think RCV in giving more power to more voters um, which will lead to more majority winners is a really healthy step forward and will open up that primary process. And of course, importantly, in the general election, when we have other candidates who want to run, who aren't part of one of the major two parties, that gives more voice and power to those voters as well, without that risk, quote unquote, of spoiling the vote and, and creating a, you know, a wrong way winner, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. And you just spoke to one of the questions that we had in here, um, which is, you know, what about when parties feel like they are the ones that should have the role of selecting their candidates that move on to the general election? Uh, and I think you speak really eloquently to that. I mean, it's it's power should be in the hands of the voters ultimately. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Obviously, we're all from nonpartisan organizations here and we're, we're just focused on the reform. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I don't see any conflict there. I mean, I think we do want majority winners. And I, I think parties understand that they're more likely to hold on to those seats if their candidate has won with a healthy majority. So I think we're all working um, for the same thing, rowing in the same direction, whatever the right metaphor is. And I think, if anything, this reform frees parties to really embrace um, the the candidates who really speak to the the values of the party. Um, and can uh, it can be a really a, a nice um, a back and forth, if you will, with a range of candidates. Again, you're we're we're removing that jeopardy of like, oh my goodness, you can't have two women running. That would be a disaster um, because they might split the vote. All of a sudden, parties can more authentic authentically, I think, engage with candidates, and um, I, I think we'd see a blossoming of more candidates who reflect larger parts of our communities. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'm just going to speak for a moment here about what all of you on this call can do uh, before bringing Meredith back up for Q&A as well. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so you can all see this link, which will also drop in the chat here. Um, but 
we want you to take action, right? Um, the best thing you can do here is contact your elected officials afterwards, your members of Congress. Um, you can use this link here uh, and let them know that this is something that's really important to you and you wanna see them take action on. Uh, this is something that they need to hear from constituents on. Particularly if you are in a state where maybe this is ranked choice voting is something you really care about, but there's a ban within at your state legislative level, or you know that there's just not as much energy for it locally. One, we at Rank the Vote would love to work with you uh, on changing that. And you know, we're the grassroots arm of this movement and really hope to work with you to build strong communities of support around ranked choice voting. Um, but if that's not there already locally, you can reach out to your members of Congress uh, and urge them to take action on this because this is something that would be so transformative uh, at the federal level if we were to have right choice voting in all congressional primary and general elections. Um, you'll see here, we do have uh, many partner organizations that we're working that are in support of this legislation. Um, and we are just really proud to be working alongside all these groups on, on this bill, and then also just on ranked choice voting across the country. Um, so if you do wanna get involved, we'll drop the links uh, in, the, in the chat here and follow up with them afterwards, but getting involved by contacting your member of Congress directly um, or signing up to, to volunteer and working with any of the groups on this call uh, to build momentum for ranked choice voting in your communities. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, bring Meredith and Cynthia uh, back on here to go through some more of these questions that we've gotten in the Q&A here. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, can you, one of you elaborate a little bit more um, on uh, the Fair Representation Act, which is a different bill, uh, but similar, and, and how... Uh, just briefly explain it and, you know, how it compares to the Ranked Choice Voting Act, please. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I would, I'll start, but I would also just love to invite Cynthia to weigh on this as well, because she has been such a, a thought leader and architect of um, the adoption of Ranked Choice Voting and proportional Ranked Choice Voting across the the country, along with Rob Ritchie, who is FairVote's uh, founder. So FairVote has three pieces of, of active legislation, and the Ranked Choice Voting Act is one of them. Um, our star, North Star Reform, is the Fair Representation Act, uh, which would implement ranked choice voting and multi-member districts for the U.S. House elections and ranked choice voting for the U.S. Senate elections. It would also establish um, new redistricting rules to prevent uh, gerrymandering. Um, so, and what this really looks to do is it looks to make every congressional district competitive and encourage politicians to represent everyone, not just their narrow party base. And I think this gets back to where Congressman Raskin really opened up um, our discussion today and how Cynthia uh, has so thoughtfully focused a discussion on how is the current governing system really responding and creating value uh, for everyday American voters. We don't have a competitive election system and it shows. And when you do introduce competition, when elected leaders um, to win and keep their seats, they have to reach out beyond their narrow party base to reach those that they are seeking to represent more broadly, it does make the issues of our day more of a focus. And it does lead to elected leaders who are incentivized to get things done. So when you, when you look at where things were, how productive was Congress back in 1992? This is the year that Fair Vote was, uh, was founded um, 32 years ago. Man, that goes fast, Cynthia, uh, mm -hmm. I tell you. But when you, when you look at the number of bills that were passed in 1992, and then you compare that with the number of bills that have been passed in our current Congress. Our current Congress is just 11% the productivity of what Congress was able to do in passing legislation 32 years ago. And I think th that is the reason why you have this sense of deep dissatisfaction uh, amongst the American people, again, of all political backgrounds on how their government is working for them. And um, the Fair Representation Act uh, would take 
ranked choice voting uh, for the Senate and um, ranked choice voting in multi-member districts for House congressional um, uh, elections and really turbocharge competition in how our, elect our electoral systems are functioning uh, in the interest of the voters that, um, that these districts are seeking to represent. And I think what makes um, you know, the Fair Representation Act is, is just a, an incredibly important piece of, of legislation for, for fair vote and the movement. But what's exciting for us is in order to, to get to that nationwide use of ranked choice voting or proportional ranked choice voting for congressional districts, you really need to show the American people how this system works, either in localities and at the state level. Uh, and that's why we're at such an important inflection year uh, with ranked choice voting. It's you know, currently in, in two states and about 50 localities across the country. And this November, we could see a tripling of the number of states that are using ranked choice voting. It's currently on the ballot in Colorado and Idaho, Nevada, and in Oregon. Uh, and so for those of you who are wondering what you can do, I would say please support these campaigns in these states. Please also support the organizations that are working with these campaigns so that the American people in those jurisdictions could understand the options they have in front of them and then make decisions about how their elections are run and how their governing system is incentivized to work in their interests. And it's only by telling the story of ranked choice voting at work in these states and these localities, and again, Fair Vote is sitting on about 25 years of research spanning 700 RCV elections, and we're learning from the research of represent women every day uh, as well. The sharing of that story uh, with the American people and other locations, that helps to spread the adoption of ranked choice voting state by state, locality by locality, and members of Congress are paying attention to this. Uh, and so that's why we're we're just delighted to be able to bring the story to, to more people, Eileen, and to share in this work that Rank the Vote and Represent Women um, do so ably alongside Fair Vote as well. That was a wonderfully uh, complete answer, but Cynthia, is there anything you wanna to add to that? Oof. I, I really can uh, turn down a chance to talk. So I'll have to th I'll think of something. Meredith, you covered so many of the right bases. So thank you. Um, I will say, I, I, you may have said this and I was distracted, but um, there's a nice history of using uh, uh, proportional ranked choice voting in this country. The reform era 100 years ago was really founded on this idea of returning the, the power to the voters and um, really uh, bolstering democracy. And that's a nice legacy that we have in this country that it really worked well in a number of big cities in New York City and in Ohio. And um, it was not seen as a partisan hot potato then, it was just seen as a good government reform. So that's a nice legacy I think to build from. And part of that legacy was what we are predicting would happen now, which is that um, there was this flourishing of different kinds of candidates getting elected in the cities that had adopted proportional ranked choice voting. Another good thing uh, to remember about it is that it's not as though we're just um, plunging into this without understanding the examples uh, around the world as well. Uh, there's some big countries that use it. Australia notably uses it uh, proportional ranked choice voting for its upper house or Senate. And I'll add that women hold 57% of the seats in that body. So that's pretty compelling. Anybody who really is serious about getting more women elected should be pretty excited about that proportional form of ranked choice voting um, used in Australia and, and Ireland. And you notice sort of a theme here that a number of the countries that inherited this first past the post winner take all voting system from uh, the UK have switched to some kind of a, uh, a, a proportional ranked system that's candidate based. And I think that's the reason that Meredith and Eileen and all of us really think it's a good fit for uh, American democracy because we're such a big country. We elect about 520,000 offices, if you can believe that. About 80% of them are nonpartisan. So a reform like ranked choice voting is a great fit for those nonpartisan uh, elections. And um, about 75 or 80% of them are also single winner. Again, ranked choice voting is a great fit for that. But when we are electing more than one person on a city council and, and for Congress with the Fair Representation Act passage, um, then having a, a ranked ballot that's really candidate driven so that voters still get to choose the, the candidates on the ballot 
um, uh, we think I think that's really the best fit. And I'll I'll just uh, end saying that the predictions that we have done at Represent Women, looking at the impact of the the use of multi seat districts in this country now, there are ten states, nine states that use multi seat districts for the state legislature. I'm sitting in one right now in Maryland. Women are about twice as likely to get elected in a multi multi seat district than a single seat district, and we know that ranked choice voting is also also super helpful. So the the top best points about the Fair Representation Act, just to recap. It ensures partisan fairness. Republicans in Maryland and Manhattan would have representation, shockingly. Democrats would also have representation in places where they may have 25 or 30% of the vote, but right now can't win a seat. It would enable multiple constituencies of color to elect candidates of choice, meaning you could have Latinos and Asian Americans and African Americans all representing a district. And it would probably lead to about a 40% increase in women's representation in Congress. Thank you both so much. Um, one of the questions that we have here uh, is about using ranked choice voting for uh, an office that decidedly could not be a uh, multi-member, which is for the U.S. presidential election. Um, I'll start with Cynthia. Can you speak to how that could possibly work and, and actually how some states are already using RCV for their presidential elections? Yes, well, two states are Maine and Alaska, so that's exciting. Um, and a lot of us got started doing this work after the 2000 election, where we saw an instance where there were three candidates on the ballot. And no matter how you feel about the outcome of that election, I think we can agree it was a non-majority winner result. And that problem could be fixed with ranked choice voting. Of course, that was the general election, but trying to think through the impact in the primaries for a president as well. Uh, Meredith can talk better about this than I, but I'll just start off saying in 2020, Five states, four states used um, a mailed ballot with a ranked um, option um, in that was used by the Democratic Party in four states, and it was phenomenally successful. Um, uh, turnout increased, I think, in like Kansas, it quintupled or something phenomenal like that. But it just it gives voters more power in the primary to say, I really want to elect a candidate whom I think can win. I don't want to waste my vote. I think that the stats are pretty staggering for the number of votes that have been cast in primaries on both sides for candidates who have dropped out by the time the election happens. And that's pretty discouraging for a voter to think, mm, I'm gonna vote for a candidate. I don't have a backup choice in case my first choice drops out. And it's an easy fix to adopt ranked choice voting for presidential primaries and general elections, I'll add. Thank you. No, Meredith, yeah. I would say just, just beautifully done. I mean, just we, we don't want any vote wasted and we want every vote to count, right? So um, in the primaries, I mean, it's just, it's ranked choice phony. Um, it would absolutely solve for um, being able to put your vote in. And if a candidate drops out, your second choice or your third choice, you know, could count. But I think the other the other example that we're, we're looking at with the presidential election just four weeks away, is the spoiler issue. You know, even with RFK Jr. out of the race, third party candidates are likely to be decisive in a presidential election that is so close. I mean, it will likely be decided by just a few thousand votes in, in three or four states. Now, this is this is not a new problem. Uh, this is a story that uh, has been around as long as I have and, and before then. <laughs> and it leads to Americans voting strategically, not voting for who they really want. Um, but out of fear of their vote not counting, voting for someone else other than who they really want. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's, you know, Ross Perot, Ralph Nader, Jill Stein, Gary Johnson, or, or others, we have been having the same debate every four years. Uh, and we have the tools to fix it uh, with ranked choice voting. So that uh, making sure that we're not wasting anyone's votes in the primaries uh, and making sure that Americans can authentically vote for who they think will best lead the country without fear of spoiling um, the vote. Uh, that's something that RCV can certainly solve for. Thank you, Meredith. And I think it's um, such a great example. I mean, I'm a believer that people really know when their vote is being sought after and they know when it really counts for the, you know, the highest office. Uh, you know, people know when they're in swing states and it's, you know, fair votes data shows that 
turnout in swing states is 11% higher than in the rest of the country. And I just see the, the clear example for that. If we had RCV in those presidential primaries, people would be more invested. If we had them in the general election, they would know that, oh, I'm not picking a spoiler candidate. I'm not picking between two people I don't like. I can truly express the value of my vote, uh, which I think would help boost turnout across the country wherever we have ranked choice voting. Absolutely. So the, one of the questions we have in here um, is about outreach. You know, some members of Congress sponsored this, the Ranked Choice Voting Act when it was introduced in previous years, um, and we hope to get them on board again. Um, maybe this is a question for, for you, Meredith, um, about uh, best the outreach plans and, and how much we want to get these people mobilized. Oh, absolutely. Well, and for all of you who are listening, uh, what I would love for you to do uh, is to reach out to your member of Congress and ask them to look at the Ranked Choice Voting Act and also the Fair Representation Act and the Voters' Choice Act. These are the three pieces of, of RCV legislation uh, that we have uh, uh, in Congress. And every year we see support for these pieces of legislation building. Uh, and we're really at an inflection point. I think, you know, whatever happens in November, what we do know is that the American people are, are going to have an increased say in the election system that is used to determine who represents them. Uh, and so coming out of that November election, I think what we're going to see is a, a change electoral map uh, in the states uh, that are uh, considering ranked choice voting and ranked choice voting in open primaries. And that's the the primaries reform that pairs so well uh, with, with ranked choice voting. So I would welcome for all of you to reach your member of Congress, ask them to look at the RCV Act, uh, contact Fair Vote as well for more uh, information. We have a dedicated team uh, that is um, conducting outreach uh, in the House and in the Senate, along with key coalition allies, such as Rank the Vote and Represent Women. And we have a great story to tell. Again, that the data is on our side. These reforms get the, um, the political system and the election system working in the interest of the voters who are represented. It's really that simple. It's a party neutral reform, and it just makes sure that our governing system is getting things done on behalf of the voters who are being governed and that they have meaningful say and meaningful choice in who represents them. Uh, but with that, I would also just welcome uh, Cynthia, if you have any, any um, thoughts to share with the audience on how they can also get involved uh, with Rank the Vote, our grassroots partner, Fair Vote, uh, who is, uh, we're researching in and advocating for adoption of, of ranked choice voting, but also Represent Women is such an incredible partner as well in telling the story of what this reform can do for meaningful and fair representation. Thank you, Meredith. I would say the same. Go to all these great websites, get the data, read the reports, um, understand the what what, what the, the framing and the analysis that we've uncovered, and then share that with your member of Congress. Um, that's an excellent place to start. Um, there has been some significant support from uh, from women members in particular. I think right now, it, my sense is that um, there's a lot going on right now in politics, and this is not necessarily the top priority, not yet, at least not this week, um, for all these members, but um, I think it's we're in the phase right now where we're we're socializing the idea, if you will, with members of Congress. So hearing from um, from from donors and supporters and constituents around the need to really be innovative to solve these problems, um, I I think it's it's hard to embrace the fact that this isn't going to happen in the the next couple of election cycles but we have to do this work now in order for it to happen in in the in the decade or so to come so we're really laying the groundwork we're sharing the information we're having conversations with people from all over the political spectrum all over the country um and uh, there's as i say lo lots of good information and we really do need the support and involvement and engagement from all the viewers on this call and um, others to share that with your member of Congress and ask them for a response. I mean, I, frankly, I think that's the most important thing is there's 
there's still misinformation out there. Um, and fortunately, we all have good answers to clear up that misinformation. We've got great answers. We've also got incredible data and evidence uh, to back up uh, to back up what these reforms are capable of. And I just wanted to say, just I know we're we're close at time, but uh, one last thought here: regardless of who wins the White House in November, Americans are remaking the way that government is working from for them from the ground up. We've seen it in the the cities first, and cities are now building to states. Uh, and so I just it's a real honor to be part of that energy of the American people taking power back and ensuring that those who are elected are working in the interests of the majority. Uh, and in that, I just uh, just want to note that just last week, the Washington Post National Editorial Board endorsed all of the state ballot measures plus Washington, D.C., uh, for RCV, um, saying that, you know, ranked choice voting, it encourages everyone uh, to campaign constructively uh, rather than focus on our, our, our um, polarized politics that has really held up the ability of our system and our elected leaders uh, to get things done. Uh, so again, um, Eileen, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to bring um, this work and the Ranked Choice Voting Act um, to uh, this broader audience. And we're just excited about what we're gonna be able to get done this November and beyond uh, because of support of people like like you who are joining us for this call, as well as the Americans in the, the cities and states that are passing this election reform on the ballot. Uh, so thanks so much again for your time. Thank you, Meredith. Cynthia, any closing remarks? Yeah, thanks, Meredith. I'll just do a quick plug for this terrific film, Majority Rules, which is now available, I believe, on YouTube and Apple TV, maybe a few other places as well. Um, and it's about the experience of building the reform and then implementing the reform and the outcome of the reform in Alaska, um, which uh, combined the uh, ranked choice voting in a top four open primary. And it's a terrific film. It features a lot of amazing women uh, who ha have gotten elected, some of them. And um, Meredith and I will be on a call tomorrow with the filmmaker, which is very exciting, and a fabulous state senator, Kathy Giesel, who um, is a big fan of, of ranked choice voting and a majority leader. And uh, so please join us. And I think that Rank the Vote can probably share the link for that webinar tomorrow. So um, I believe there's a link to watch the film and then come and discuss it with us uh, tomorrow afternoon. And um, it's just, it's uh, it's really focused on Alaska, but it's pretty easy to see how the um, the policies and, and uh, systems that we're proposing could be implemented everywhere based on hearing from the officials who were running, the candidates who were running, and then the people who got elected. It's pretty exciting. Thank you both, Cynthia and Meredith, for your insight. Thank you to the teams at Fair Vote and Represent Women for putting this event on with us. And of course, to Congressman Jamie Raskin for taking the time to speak with us about this bill. Uh, we really appreciate all of you listening in today. Uh, you've, you've heard it here, our theory of change, work on ranked choice voting at any level of government. It's all building up towards collective wins. Uh, and we look forward to working with you on that in the future. And don't forget to contact your member of Congress. Thank you, everyone.